Have you ever watched a TV show or a movie and you knew exactly how it was going to turn out, exactly how the story was going to go, only to have a plot twist completely change and blow your mind? So the, the story was completely different than how you thought it was going to turn out and it made the movie or the story so much better. Or maybe, you know, you've, you've had your boss want to bring you into the office and want to have a discussion with you, and you're sitting there thinking, oh no, what did I do wrong? You know, only to have something positive happen, or, or, or something completely different than what you expected come out of that discussion. You see, sometimes in life, what we expect isn't really what's going to happen, what's going to come. Sometime in li sometimes in life, we, we come to these forks in the road where one of two things can happen and, and we'll, we'll be faced with a decision. We can either accept that, that something new is coming and go down that road or we can dig our heels in and decide that things have to stay they were the way they were, the way we thought. You know, we, we have these ideas in our mind of, of what our life is going to look like. We have ideas of what ministry should look like or what this program or relationship should look like. But sometimes God's plans are different than our own. You know, William Faulkner, the, the great American author, had this to say about the writing process and about life. Sometimes you have to kill your darlings. In writing and in living, you must destroy what you like to get what you love. Sometimes our own faulty notions, our own ideas of what's good has to die for something greater to come. And, and I realize the irony of, of having a statement called Kill Your Darlings on Valentine's Day weekend. I, I wrote this before I realized that. So <laughs> give me a little bit of grace here. But, you know, sometimes we, we think about these things and, and I, I don't want to pull the wool over your eyes. When, when you have to die to yourself or, or let an idea die, it hurts. It is painful. It's not a fun process when, when the church closes, when you have to, to get up and move to a new city because the job that you thought was going to last where you are has, has ended, when your relationship fails. Those aren't pleasant experiences, but often they are necessary to get you where you need to go. You know, I think that's kind of the experience Peter was having as we get into today's gospel lesson. You see, just before this was Peter's confession of the Christ, where he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you're no longer Simon. You are Peter. You're the rock. And I think Peter embraced that name. He was, he was pretty pumped. He was probably talking to the other 11. I don't know if you heard. Jesus gave me a new name. I'm a pretty swell guy. And then Jesus has one of his passion predictions. He talks about what he's about to do, what he's about to go through in Jerusalem. And, and Peter decides, well, he called me the rock. That must mean I'm his bodyguard. And so he jumps up, never, Lord. That's never going to happen to you. And he has to get rebuked by Jesus. He says, get behind me. Say, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And, and, and Jesus loved Peter. That's part of why he gave him a new name. But Jesus had to use this as a teaching moment for Peter. And, and, and as we get to the end of, of that discussion, that story, as the disciples are around, Jesus says this, Truly I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. And you know, Peter, sometimes he's kind of like the disciple, he's like us, you know, and, and kind of like the, the way that Pastor Mike described the disciples a few weeks ago. They're not always geniuses. Sometimes they don't get it. He seems to ignore the passion prediction Jesus he just had. And so he starts to think, oh well, I guess I just had the timing or the, the way that God was going to bring about this thing wrong. And then they go up the mountain to pray. And what happens? Jesus is transfigured. His robes are turned white. Elijah and Moses appear. Peter starts thinking, this is it. This is the moment. God's kingdom is coming now. You know, God's going to go down the mountain and we are going to lay the smack down on Rome. We are going to flip the tables. We're going we're to shake everything up. And, and he's a little terrified too because Jesus is glowing and Elijah and Moses are there. So he starts babbling. He doesn't know what he's saying. Uh, let's, let's build some tabernacles. One for you and Elijah and Moses. And and we'll remember this event. And then just like he was rebuked six days earlier by Jesus, now he gets rebuked by God the Father who speaks out of the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. He's saying to Peter, 
Stop thinking you've got it figured out. Stop holding on to your idea of the story, to your idea of what the Messiah is going to be, and listen to what Jesus tells you. And, you know, sometimes I got to admit, I, I, I feel a little bad for Peter. You know, he, he's kind of the, the whipping boy of the Gospels. He constantly has to get rebuked. He's, he's the only one bold enough to stand up and, and say something to Jesus. He's the only one bold enough to ask the questions and, and voice his opinion. He's kind of the representative of the disciples. But that also means he's often the, the teaching moment for himself and for the rest of the disciples. He's the guy that, that gets put back in his place. And, you know, I, I do want to say this, though, and I want to make this abundantly clear. Peter isn't rebuked for his boldness or for asking questions. He is rebuked and disciplined for his misunderstanding. Jesus is trying to help guide him into the truth. Help him to have a, a greater understanding of what's happening. A greater understanding of the gospel. You see, the disciples, they constantly think they've, they've got it figured out. They're going to pigeonhole God. You know, they, they have this idea of what the kingdom is going to be like. And they want to fit Jesus into that block of, of what they understand God's kingdom is, of what they understand the Messiah to mean. They thought it was about this, this little plot of land in the Middle East, and that was the end goal for God. But God's plans were so much greater. They had this narrow view. And I think the same thing is true for you and I a lot of times. Sometimes we have this narrow view of what God is doing, but he's doing something so much greater with our story. But sometimes that means we have to die to our own ideas. We have to kill our darlings, our notions of the story of what our lives are going to be like so that God's story can take charge, so that God's story can become our story. You see, sometimes we're, we're kind of like those people who, who are in the forest and we're so focused on the tree that we miss the rest of what's around us. You know, we get focused on an idea and maybe it's some pain we're going through. We get focused on, on some experience we've had. And, and it's easy to get caught up in those moments. They, 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 they're very emotional. They're very hard for us to deal with sometimes when, we, when we're dealing with pain or when we're dealing with excitement and we miss the bigger picture. But sometimes when we go through those things, that's when the greater things emerge. And I want to say that those moments are teaching moments. God is disciplining us. And it's, if you ask any parent, they'll say that, that love is a balance between discipline and freedom. You know, you have to give your children free to be, freedom to be who they are, to express themselves, to, to live out who they are, you know, whether or not they're bold or, or some other characteristic. But you also have to give them discipline so they grow up to be the right kind of people. So they grow up with the right mentality, with the right values. But it's a balance between the two. And I want you to know that, that God doesn't want you to change who you are. He wants you to be true to who you are. But he wants that person to serve his kingdom. He doesn't want it to serve our own selfish needs, our own selfish ambitions, or our own, you know, or, or nothing at all, and just willingly go about our, our days without any direction at all. God wants us to be serving his kingdom. He wants our story to be joined with his story. That's part of why Peter gets rebuked, and it's why you and I get rebuked. It's why we're disciplined. It's why we go through different trials and tests, so that we can, God uses those difficult circumstances of our lives to create something new, something greater. You see, Peter wasn't the only one of the disciples who didn't get it. As they were walking down the mountain, and Jesus told them, you know, you're, don't say anything about this until the Son of Man rises from the dead. They're confused. They don't know what rising from the dead means. And I think Jesus said this because God's story, God's plan, can only be fully understood in hindsight. You know, they couldn't understand it until after the resurrection. And people today, sometimes they still don't get God's story. They find it offensive. They find the idea of a God who would suffer and die in our place, or who had to suffer and die for our forgiveness, offensive. They don't like the idea of the cross. And you know, when we're in the middle of, of trials, we're in the middle of suffering or, or painful experiences, we don't really like to hear that, that maybe God is working through that to shape us into something new. And, and I'm not trying to make light of what you might be going through. But I think God uses those. And sometimes we don't always understand how it's being used in those days. But we will be able to look back and see how God has disciplined us and shaped us to become the kind of people, the kind of disciples that put God first and are able to, to be shaped and defined by his story, by his gospel message.
You know, I've, I've been through an experience where, where I've had to be disciplined. And when I look back, I realize how much of, of what I had in mind, the ideas I had, were very selfish and egocentric. They were all about me and what I thought was right. And, and God had to completely break me and, and shatter me. And part of that is because I'm just a very stubborn person. Sometimes I need to get out of my own way, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to take my heels in a little longer than I should sometimes. But I went to Australia and I had this idea that of what my life was going to be. I went down there to teach. I was going to get a job. I was going to stay there and just enjoy the, the beach life. But that wasn't what God had in store. After eight months there, I had one day of work in the last four months I lived there. And when minimum wage is $18 an hour, it's pretty hard to pay for rent and food when you've got zero dollars coming back in. You know, it's a lot easier to spend money pretty quickly in that kind of an economy. And it was in that moment when I, when I began to get connected to a, a church. And I was completely broken because I didn't know what to do with my life. I didn't know where God was leading me. And it was there that some people began to walk alongside me and mentor me and lead me to follow Jesus in a deeper way, to walk with him in a deeper way. And it was there that, that those people and a couple of their friends began to drag, pull, and push me towards ministry. A little bit kicking and screaming, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't, it wasn't my idea. But I couldn't be happier now with where I am. But, but I had to die to myself. My darlings had to die. My ideas of what my life was going to be had to die for something greater to emerge. You see, I think God, sometimes he takes, he breaks us, or, or lets us be broken, might be a better way of phrasing it, so that out of the ashes, a phoenix can rise. So that something greater can emerge from what's been killed. You know, a, a mosaic can be created out of the shattered glass. Something new and greater can emerge. I mean, that's what happened with Peter. Jesus rebuked him and broke him. He was, he was a disciple who had a narrow vision of the kingdom. And over time, he got broken down until in Acts we see this, this bold, ferocious man who was willing to stand in the face of all kinds of opposition, who would not be silenced, who would not be stopped to proclaim the hope of God that had been revealed in Christ Jesus. He was not afraid. He used that, that bold personality, was redirected for God's mission. And I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what's been happening in your life. You might be going through dark times. You might be in a hopeless place. And I'm not trying to make light of that, but know that there is hope in that darkness. There is hope for you. You see, our God... He is the God who went to the grave, but he's also the God who overcame the grave. He is the God who resurrects the broken pieces of your life into something new, into something greater. He can take those pieces, if you're, if you're willing to offer them to him, and put them back together and use them for his purposes. So if you're willing, if you're willing, let your, let your darlings be killed. Let your ideas of what God is trying to do with your life, let your ideas of God's kingdom be broken. So that his story, his narrative, can take the forefront, can guide you into all truth, and can give you that hope, that peace, that can only be found in Christ. And now may that truth keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.